There are various types of main distribution frames, or MDFs, that can be found in telephone exchanges. Basically, they allow equipment in the exchange to be connected to cables from outside using colour-coded wires called jumpers to connect the appropriate metal connectors together. These connectors are mounted on blocks, which come in a variety of shapes, sizes and types. With the exception of a few single-sided MDFs, most MDFs have two sides, like this one we see here. The exchange, or the E side, also known as the equipment side, and the distribution, or D side, also known as the line side. The frame has been designed so that in most cases, circuits are connected from one side of the frame to the other. As you probably already guessed, the exchange equipment is connected to the exchange side and the external cables are connected to the D or line side. Each pair of metal tags connects to either a piece of equipment in the exchange or a cable pair going out to an end user's premises. These tags are identified by a unique number. For the equipment side, this is an equipment number. For the line side, this is termed a bar pair. These aren't always easy to find on a large MDF, so to help, all MDFs are mapped. Mapping works on a simple grid system when viewed from the side and is set on vertical lines or verts and horizontal lines or levels. This allows every block to be identified by a unique line of information. A block is still mapped to the appropriate vert and level even if there is a block missing below it. For example, this block here is on the fourth vertical, third level up. It isn't altered by having the block below it missing. Some MDFs have been extended as the exchange has grown larger. Naturally, this will extend the number of verticals already installed. However, where space is limited at one end of the MDF, an extension may be fitted to the MDF at vert 1 and be installed against the existing number range. Using the number range 301, 302, 303, like this. So to identify a particular pair of tags on a particular block, on a particular MDF, we use a mapping reference, like this. One is the number of the MDF. Some buildings have more than one MDF. Here mapping on this frame would begin two, three, etc. E indicates which side of the frame the block is located. In this case, it is the E or exchange side. Blocks on the other side will be D. 027 refers to the vertical or vert, in this case 27. Remember, MDFs count up from one end, except in cases where an extension has been fitted. U06 tells us two things. Firstly, the U means that the blocks count up from the bottom, and that it is the block number 6. Some exchanges have blocks installed that count from the top of the frame downwards and this is indicated by the letter D rather than the letter U. 023 refers to the specific tags on the block, pair 23 in this case. This is where the circuit should be connected. This means that to provide a single jumper wire we require two mapping references, one for each end of each jumper wire used for the circuit. In some cases the mapping reference may not have been quoted. Whilst this is inconvenient, all is not lost as we can still use the equipment number and bar pair to identify the correct points where the circuits need to be connected. Equipment numbers, or ENs, can be shown in two forms. Some are shown in this format. These are for System X exchanges. The other form looks like this. These are for AXE 10 exchanges. Depending on the type of exchange you are in, many exchanges will have both types present on the MDF and both present the same conditions to the EN block on the MDF. The bar pair blocks are on the D side of the MDF. Each of the cables terminated here will be identified by a letter, usually in alphabetical order, A, B, C, etc. to Z, then A, 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 B, A, C, and so on, depending on how many cables are required to provide service to all end users in the area. Again, there are different types of block and each block is marked with pair numbers indicating which pairs are connected to each block and in which direction they count. The bar pair and EN may or may not be mapped. The general consensus is, if they are mapped, it's a bonus. 
It is common for large exchanges to have more than one MDF and for circuits to be connected from the E side of one to the D side of another. Where this happens, tie circuits are used. These are permanent cables that run between each of the frames allowing circuits to be provided as required. Communications providers equipment is installed in suitable areas and exchanges and are connected to the MDF by tie cables. Areas are provided for this and are called multi-user areas or MUAs. This equipment usually consists of a digital switched line access multiplexer or DSLAM and a small cross connection frame called a handover distribution frame or HDF. Although different CPs will have a different type of DSLAM equipment, they all essentially do the same thing. The DSLAM is housed in a cabinet similar to this. The handover distribution frame is on the left. HDFs vary in size depending on the amount of cables the communications provider has ordered. Each of these installations is called a point of presence or POP. It is not unusual for some of the bigger comms providers to have more than one POP in a big exchange. Each POP will include power supplies, metering and a telephone service. All of this equipment belongs to the CP, not BT. A label identifies the details of the installation, the CP, the site ID and other useful information. Apart from the DSLAM, the cabinets will usually include an item of equipment called a splitter. This allows the signal from the end user to be split into the appropriate telephony and broadband components. We normally think of these services as going out to the end user, so in reality, this device merges or filters in the dial tone to the broadband or DSL signal prior to being sent out from the exchange. This is why end users have micro filters plugged into their telephone sockets to filter out the dial tone to the telephone. This is one type of splitter. Plugs are usually set in groups of three, with one plug connected to the CP's DSLAM equipment, one containing dial tone from the MDF, and the third taking the combined signals back to the MDF for connection to the end user. The ports here have been allocated by the CP for shared metallic path facility circuits, as all three plugs are present. The ports here have been allocated for metallic path facility circuits only. These do not always have a dial tone supplied, so the plug that would normally bring the dial tone for an SMPF service is missing. Different CPs use different types of splitter, and they don't all look the same. The handover distribution frame is the point where OpenReach and the CP connect their cables together. The cables that connect the HDF and the MDF are termed LLUL, which connect to the D side of the MDF, and LLUT, which connect to the E side of the MDF. These cables from the MDF to the HDF are OpenReach's responsibility. It's worth mentioning that there are some sites where the CP equipment is located outside a BT building, either within or outside the perimeter fence. These sites may have cables designated LLUD, LLUS or other designations, so don't be worried if you see these. The cables from both the MDF and the CP's equipment terminate on the blocks on the HDF. There are a number of types of connection block. This one is an old type fitted with chrome connections. It has enough room for 1,800 connections. That's 1,800 MPF circuits or 900 SMPF circuits. Each strip has 10 circuits and each block has 10 strips, giving 100 circuits. They are labelled with the LLU cable ID. This one is fitted with the new high density strip connections. The current design of the HDF allows a maximum of 4,800 connections. That's 4,800 MPF circuits or 2,400 SMPF circuits. Generally, these are built back to back, giving up to 2,400 connections on each side. Each block is clearly identified with its ID number, with labelling being placed either on the strip underneath each block or to the upper left of the block on the back plane. This new method ensures that cables do not obscure the ID label. The front of these blocks usually have blue pair marker strips for the LLUL cables and green for the LLUT cables. To ensure that each MPF circuit can be tested following provision, 
or where there may be a fault, a test access matrix or TAM is provided. All CPs have some sort of TAM installed in their cabinets and this allows the CP to test their own circuits. As you might imagine, there are different types of TAM equipment, but they all perform similar functions. The TAM is remotely accessed and used to carry out a series of tests on any circuit connected to it. The test will check things such as the condition of the circuit towards the end user and also toward the equipment provided by the CP. However, OpenReach must also be able to carry out a test as they have the responsibility for the metallic path of each of these circuits. Each MPF circuit is connected to an OpenReach TAM port before being terminated to the bar pair. Each TAM has 100 ports which are cabled to the blocks on the MDF. The TAM in block is found on the D side of the MDF. The TAM out block is on the E side. So to recap, we've seen that the MDF has an E side and a D side. Equipment is generally connected to the E side and the external cables to the D side. Some exchanges have more than one MDF and they are connected together using tie circuits. Communication providers have equipment that is connected to the MDFs through handover distribution frames. CP equipment usually consists of a digital switched line access multiplexer or DSLAM, a splitter which merges telephony and digital services such as broadband. And there is also a test access matrix or TAM which is used by the CP to test the circuit.